morning, everyone. We are here, uh, Dr. Brian Curley and I have the pleasure today to interview Tom Brenna, who is a professor of pediatrics at Dell Medical School in Austin, Texas. Uh, prior to that, he was a professor of human nutrition chemistry, chemical biology, and food science at Cornell University in the frozen wasteland of Ithaca, New York. Uh, his group's basic research is into the chemical, biochemical, metabolic, genetic, and ecological aspects of fatty acids that have and he has had a decisive influence on modern knowledge of these key nutrients. He was also at one point a member of the uh, Dietary Guidelines um, Guidance Committee. Have I got that right, Tom? It's called the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee and it creates scientific statements uh, that are then used as input for the dietary guidelines for Americans, DGAC, DJA, it's very confusing. Yes, that's, uh, I actually uh, did a little bit of research on behalf of Nina Tichholz, who runs the, runs a uh, not-for-profit, the name of which escapes me right at the moment, that is aimed at helping to reform the dietary guidelines. So that might be an interesting thing we could discuss your experience on there. But um, tell us a little, what are you working on right now? What's the most recent and interesting thing that you've published? Well, we had a pretty good year and a pretty good last 12 months. Um, uh, there are two things we're particularly uh, pleased with. Um, one, both of them uh, are, uh, punctuation points, maybe not periods, but at least semicolons um, of uh, 10 years of work, more than 10 years of work. So one of them was a uh, randomized trial of uh, the certain formulations of ready to use therapeutic foods um, in kids that uh, are diagnosed with severe acute malnutrition. So this is an issue in places where food is limiting, uh, not necessarily the United States, although I'm sure that some of the same issues are involved. And uh, this was a study that took place in Malawi, the African country of Malawi, which is in um, East Africa. And uh, in this study, um, we did a follow on a previous study reformulating these ready to use therapeutic foods and taking the fairly big gamble that um, with uh, a, an adjusted uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid com uh, composition that we would see long-term changes in improvements actually in uh, their cognitive ability. And in fact, that's exactly what we saw. It was uh, uh, a improvement in their developmental aptitude scores uh, in six months after they had finished uh, recovery with these uh, ready to use therapeutic foods. And um, that was exciting enough, but uh, we uh, managed to pull the whole thing together and get it into print in time to uh, discuss uh, the results and get in improved uh, recommendations uh, at the Codex Elementarius uh, meetings in November, which are part of the World Health Organization. So these are uh, Codex Elementarius means food code, roughly speaking. And uh, they're a set of uh, basically UN WHO recommendations for what food should look like, not just about fat and certainly not only about the brain, uh, but uh, they were- Sort of beyond- whatever. Beyond a dietary guideline, they're actually talking about the makeup of different food products, much more specific from what I uh, understand. That, yeah, that's right. That's right. And uh, we, we were able to um, get a, a, a improvement, substantial improvement uh, in the, the recommendations for, um, for the composition of these foods with an emphasis on brain health. Uh, my personal... Uh, opinion is that we should be focused on brain health. Um, we spend much too much time on uh, the health problems of 50-year-old uh, men. Um, and uh, <laughs> by that, I mean 
no yeah, no offense to the I, current I, group of people here brian's the young one i suspect I'm not right, that uh, but i i you know it's it's the usual dreary old list of uh, chronic uh, diseases uh, below the neck so it would be heart disease and cancer and diabetes and, and right. other which is everything else and i personally think the arguments should be are, are far more important if we are considering above the neck nutrition above the neck as a psychiatrist friend of mine likes to put it. Um, and uh, if we were focused on uh, pregnancy and lactation, so maternal and child nutrition, which are the most demanding normal periods of physiology for uh, humans. Uh, pregnancy is not a disease. It's not a, uh, uh, some kind of a, a weird thing. It's just the most demanding period, uh, uh, normal period uh, for humans. And uh, uh, while I'm at it for every other animal, and right. uh, that's what we ought to be studying uh, rather than uh, all this stuff on uh, whether uh, this or that does something for uh, heart disease. If we get the brain right, the rest will be, will be right as well. So that's the first that's thing. That's exactly the point I, I, I wanted to raise. One assumes that if you're getting that right, then you've got the rest of the organism over the rest of its life pretty close to optimal. Uh, right. Um, and in the, the converse that has been said by others that if you get the heart right, get the brain right, um, is almost certainly falsified at this point. Um, and because people are not getting the heart right, um, I mean, we've been arguing about saturated fat for 70 years and nothing seems to have been resolved. Um, whereas uh, there's many other things that have been resolved. And so um, I have lots and lots of opinions about uh, how that might have uh, gone, um, but there's a lot more of the science in there. And, uh, and there's less uh, about, uh, I think, less controversy about the brain, just getting people to actually think about the brain. And we've got a whole lot right. of data out there on the, pre on the well, preclinical side and even in the clinical I'd, side. I'd like to quote you. You said uh, in describing your RCT that the results were somewhat surprising. Back in 2011, you wrote, though no human randomized controlled trials on minimal W. W3, omega-3 requirements in pregnancy and lactation have been conducted. The weight of animal evidence compellingly shows that randomizing pregnant or lactating humans to diets that include high linole linoleate oils as the sole source of fat would be frankly unethical because they would result in some suboptimal child development. So you weren't too surprised by this. It's nice to see that you confirmed it, but this is something you've been working on for a long time, as you said. Yes, in fact, that uh, that 2011 article that you're quoting from was uh, the origins of uh, my actual, not interest in the area, but certainly uh, my, my origins in, in interest and introduction to the story of uh, severe acute malnutrition and, and what is known as wasting um, in right. kids that just don't get enough protein and calories. That particular point uh, is directed to the general idea that we call evidence-based medicine, which I'm afraid eliminates 95% of all the evidence, little e evidence that uh, informs nutrition and focuses 100% on human studies. Human studies are the worst studies. They are by far the worst. I don't think it's possible that, that a serious argument can be made otherwise. You can't control what, what humans eat. You can't control what their right. exercise is like. You can't control their genetics. You can't control any of those things. That's what I mean by worst. It's very right. uncontrollable. Whereas when we do animal studies, we control all those things, and we can do it in a in a, um, in, and we hope to do it in a smart way. Not all animal studies are done smartly, and probably less than half are, but uh, we can control them very well. And so we really understand the principles from those studies. And then we apply them to, to the human studies more or less as confirmation. The reason I was surprised, last point, the reason I was surprised was not that I thought it should work this way. The reason I was surprised is because they're very difficult uh, experiments. They're very hard to control. And we had a big advantage in these, in these studies because we can control everything the kids eat. And that's- The kids were hospitalized, situation. right? They're not hospitalized. They're out in the field oh, in remote places okay. in, uh, in Africa. Uh, they go to a clinic. The clinic is a table under a tree. 
And okay. uh, there's okay. a person who's trained to do a diagnosis. So they look at the mid upper arm circumference, or they look at uh, uh, known aspects of wasting pitting in the feet and a couple other things like that. Um, so they say, hey, you're not getting enough calories or protein, and it should be fairly obvious, but there is criteria. They then are fed these ready-to-use therapeutic foods, and you might have heard of one of them called uh, Plumpy Nut. That was uh, uh, the first one. Uh, that was discussed by Anderson Cooper on 60 Minutes years and years ago. But at any rate, um, uh, the kids are given these packets of, uh, of hermetically sealed uh, therapeutic foods that are peanut butter, non fat fat dry milk, uh, vitamins and minerals, sugar, and, uh, and lots of oil. And uh, they can eat them themselves, and they eat only that. Okay. The vast majority of what they eat is that. So now I've figured out a way to control the diet in a study. The whole thing is controlled. They're not eating. Yeah, they're, uh, they're, their only there. other option is starvation, correct? Uh, that's pretty much the way it is. And plus, the, the parents have, have usually traveled a fair distance to get to this clinic. Right. And they're motivated. They're bringing back the, um, the, the, the foods and um, uh, have been told by the doctor to, to uh to uh have the children eat only that and come back in two weeks and we'll uh, we'll give you another supply of it okay so, i'm gonna all right excellent well thank, thanks again for joining um for for those listening you know we're talking about um you know being able to control for things with studies especially with children you know there are there are ethical issues about you know changes that you would make in someone's diet or what you would withhold or what you would provide so in this situation of of starvation, you know, this is this is a, a a total boon. This is wonderful to be able to provide food um, uh, for these populations, like children in Malawi, like you were talking about. So it is it's really difficult to study, you know, with people and a lot of people who look into nutrition for themselves or you know wanting to learn more. They want to know, you know, why am I reading about a rat? <laughs> because it's not easy to to learn things when you have when you're dealing with people out in the wild, people going to work, people just, you know, going about their business. Um, but uh, Tom, again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, what did you, did you see this as a, an, as an opportunity that hadn't been done before this kind of, this kind of research with, like you said, above the neck in terms of malnutrition, was there just, was there just nothing else out in the field? Did you see this as like a, a, a new spearhead? There's been, studies, little dribs and drabs here and there, but these are very difficult studies from the perspective of ha having to do measurements on development. It's much easier to weigh a kid, to measure length, to take a blood sample and do an analysis and talk about biomarkers. Well, it'd be really nice if we could take a blood sample and, uh, and, and measure something and then say, well, that means that the kid's IQ is going to be something at, uh, at right. age 10. But we can't do that. So what we have to do is the old-fashioned uh, questionnaire kind of thing and testing sorts of things. So uh, there have been, um, to my knowledge, very few studies, if any. I don't think there are any any studies uh, actually in, in this area of actually uh, looking at brain development. Um, and we had published a few years earlier a study showing that their omega-3 levels crash these very same kids when you put them on a conventional formula of uh, these ready-to-use therapeutic foods. They crash in four weeks by 25%. Um, and so when we reformulated them with high oleic peanuts and high oleic, uh, uh, other high oleic oils, um, or at least low linoleic air oils, um, we um, showed that we could maintain their levels, or I should say the kids maintain their levels by their own synthesis. That is to say, when we give them the plant omega-3, alpha linolenic acid, they were able to make the brain omega-3 DHA that they needed in their own bodies by reformulating uh, their, um, uh, this. Your, uh, right. Food. By take, taking the precursor, the short chain uh, omega-3 and up converting it to the long chain omega-3. Yeah, you're an incredibly, right. Right. you're an incredibly quotable guy, Tom, just so you know. Um, and I, Presume it's okay if I call you, if I address you as Tom. Just don't call me late for dinner. <laughs> okay. Um, Sorry, I'm, too, I'm too casual. So, <laughs> yeah, there's a uh, quote. Put another way, only two ways are known to increase circulating DHA status in humans. 
One, consume preformed DHA. Two, lower dietary linoleic acid. This is from another paper you published a few years back, I guess in 2020. But that actually goes back to your time as president of uh, the International Society for the Study of Fatty Acids and Lipids, right? That's an official position of that organization, I think you mentioned uh, in another talk that you did. Yeah, as a matter of fact, it is. And, and uh, we, we generated a, a, a paper showing that that, that is the case. Um, it's uh, back in 2007 or 2009, something like that, um, that tabulated all the papers that people had uh, reported on studies of using a precursor omega-3, whether, whether it was the short chain one or even um, EPA, which is a, a, a fish oil fatty acid, which is much closer to DHA, but even that uh, doesn't uh, increase circulating DHA levels. Uh, and so uh, when I say that there are only two ways known to increase circulating DHA, um, I also, the, the context, that, sorry, the converse is also the, the case that other methods have been tried, ones that we thought would work back in the 20th century, and they right. don't work. They just don't work. You just increase the omega-3. And that's why the story of just having a ratio between omega-6 and omega-3 is just not a way to think about this as a sort of general concept if you if you increase omega-3 you don't get any more dha but if you decrease omega-6 linoleic you do get more um uh, dha i should have said dha specifically um right so and, it's a necessary uh, it's a necessary precondition would you like an update on that we found the third way well that's the other paper you published this year right so yeah go ahead yeah that's that's um in fact i that wasn't on my list of uh, of my second cool one but anyway um that, oh that no is, okay great. so you got three I cool have ones one great beside that, but, I, but the point that the point that you seem to have picked up tucker is that um uh, in a pregnancy that is in pregnant human women who are all consuming the same amount of dha as a supplement, so they all have the same amount. Um, when they are randomized to two different amounts of choline, uh, which were something like 400 milligrams or 800 milligrams, I forget the exact numbers that are in the paper, we actually saw a striking increase in the circulating DHA level. That was, uh, when I say surprising, I don't mean I'm, I'm shock the reason we measured it is to see if there's an effect we were surprised at the magnitude of the effect and um if you ask me why it works that way you'll get a lot of hand waving um fair but, enough um, uh and and the, the the way i explain it um in the absence of specific experiments is that when dha comes in nutritionally and choline come in nutritionally as they work their way through metabolism they actually meet in a single molecule uh, called a phosphatidylcholine so these are membrane molecules that are present uh, in very high concentrations in the retina which is the the light sensing part of the eye uh, which right. we all think of as a part of the brain um, and then there is phosphatidyl Choline containing DHA also in the brain. So I, I, I like to think that that one or the other of these molecules may be limiting, and that's what what is it uh, what's at work here. Or the I mean that would suggest that for instance could explain why fish seems to have such a consistent benefit, whereas fish oil doesn't seem to have a great benefit over the long term. That in fit, when you're eating fish, you're getting a lot of preformed uh, phospholipids containing DHA. Yeah, is that and, plausible? And you know that those are that those are digested to a large degree, although some of them are not digested. And we had done studies in the 1990s, and then followed up in the in the um, after the turn of the millennium uh, to show that um, that just with oils, you, you get a better targeting of DHA and another omega-3 that's important for the brain arachidonic acid to the brain 
um, if they come in as a fossil lipid rather than as a triglyceride. That is not to say that one is absorbed more than the other. That's almost certainly not the case. But it is to say that the metabolism right. post absorption seems to target uh, seems to target the brain if they come in as fossil lipid. So it could it could be just the fact that you're getting a load of choline at the same time as you're getting a load of DHA, and the body's then got the correct precursors to reassemble the phospholipids and send them off where they're needed. That's my interpretation. Yeah, that's right. Okay, that's that's fascinating. That's a huge study. The fish oil industry must be. Uh, if they're aware of this, we're unhappy with that. It um, takes a while for this stuff to dribble out, but um, uh, they, they, they will uh, eventually hear it. Well, that's why we're doing this podcast, hopefully speed that up a little bit. Um, now, what was the third paper, uh, your other interesting paper that you were uh, hinting at? This one is, um, it is much more uh, technological. So um, I'll, I'll explain it, and I will also say that uh, I have a bit of a business interest in this. I have a little bit of investment in this, so uh, in, in the company that's doing this. So it, you're, you now have fair warning. Um, the uh, DHA as an omega-3 and all PUFAs really are well, well known as being uh, susceptible to oxidation, whether they are in a food product that could be in fish or in uh, a, a capsule or uh, in the body. They're, they're susceptible to the reaction of oxygen with certain positions in the molecule <clears throat> that uh, destroy the molecule. We'll talk about its damage, but it really destroys the molecule. So, breaks breaks so it up, right. Yeah, that's right. Breaks it up, right. Um, and so an insight that's now 15 years old is that there's a certain position it's it's uh for the technical listeners out there it's a it, between the two double bonds there's a ch2 between the two double bonds and all these polyunsaturates. saturates and oxidation is initiated uh, by abstraction of a hydrogen atom from uh from that position it's the weakest ch bond in the molecule which is the, the difference in the reason why saturated fats are so much more stable than an unsaturated or a polyunsaturated fat. Uh, that, that's They're, right. And it's particularly yeah. these, these positions, which from a chemical point of view are called bisallylic or doubly allylic positions. Now I'm talking uh, organic chemistry, but at any rate, um, thank they, you, professor. Are, yeah. And, um, and so the insight first was that, and the second insight is, well, how do you, how could you possibly reinforce a bond? How you could, how could you make the bond, stronger so that it's less susceptible to attack by oxygen. And an, an answer is to use the stable isotope of hydrogen known as deuterium. Deuterium ah. participates in all the same reactions, but it's a subtle point of <clears throat> actually um, quantum mechanics um, that um, the CD bond is stronger than the CH bond. At least that's one way to, to, to say it. And so uh, when you put that heavier hydrogen called deuterium onto that position, you actually dramatically reduce the rate of oxidation of the molecule and the rate of destruction of that molecule. And so that, that in order to do that, you have to do a chemical synthesis. So this is not, not something that you can extract out of a fish, out of the ocean, out of a out of an algae, out of a krill, you have to actually or do buy something. at the supermarket. Obviously, can't buy it at the supermarket. Sorry, not yet. And so, um, but if you do substitute those deuteriums in that position, um, we've got lots of data that have been published over the years showing that in chemically and in biological systems, you stabilize the molecule against oxidation. Well, cutting to the paper that was published this year in a, uh, a uh, animal model of uh, oxidation of the retina. I said a moment ago that the retina is rich in DHA, omega-3 DHA. Um, it's also uh, one of the most active, really in, in the most active uh, points of oxidation in the whole body. The rate of oxidative metabolism is enormous in the retina. 
Mm -hmm. and, um, and so you have the production of these reactive oxygen species alongside one of the most labile or fragile molecules, you could say, right next to each other. And so that oxidative uh, process or the protection against oxidation for DHA can go awry. So in this study, we um, fed, and this is oral feeding of, of uh, these deuterium-reinforced DHA molecules. Um, they go throughout the body, but they get up to uh, quite rapidly up to about 50%, and you can go to, go, go to pretty much as high as you want. But once they get to about to 50%, they completely block a oxidative process that otherwise causes the animal to go blind. Uh, in about a week. And so vision is normal at the beginning of the study. Um, the animals that have, the animals of the controls that don't get the special deuterated DHA, um, they are blind, their retinas, uh, all their photoreceptors die uh, by the end of a week and they're blind. Uh, but the ones that had this DHA, they have normal vision at the beginning and they have normal vision at the end and their retinas look normal at the end. So that's a big one that we hope is going to be an important thing for, um, for instance, age-related macular degeneration, for which um, uh, lipid oxidation is a important process, contributory process, possibly a triggering process. You can't really say in a lot of these things what really triggers it, but um, th that's one. I personally- well, that's, And that's, for the audience, age-related macular degeneration is not only the leading cause of blindness, but it's one of the few medical conditions where you can read a lot in the literature about high omega-6, to your point before, but not omega-3 supplementation seeming to be a causal part of the process. So that's a huge finding to be able to demonstrate that that oxidative stress pathway. And that kind of gets to my next question is, why do you think it is high omega-6 has a negative effect against omega-3? Why is consuming more linoleic acid reducing DHA in the body? We've had a pretty good idea about the answer to that question since 1963. This is okay. no mystery. We understand it at just about every level you can understand it. So I can start in 1963, I probably should, if you feed, if you prepare diets with the plant-based omega-6 and omega-3, and, and you hold, you prepare a series of diets and you hold the omega-3 constant, and you go from very low omega-6 to very high omega-6, these are various diets, and you're feeding them to rats. You can feed them to monkeys, you can feed them to pigs, you can feed them to chickens, feed them anything you want. But the first studies were done in rats. What you will find is at very low levels of omega-6, the omega-3 is converted at quite high levels to DHA to EPA. Those are the active ones. Those are the ones right. you find in fish oil. As you ramp up the omega-6, those levels of DHA and EPA drop. They drop rather dramatically based on the diets that are used in comparing those to human diets. So we've understood that since 1963. Right. It's been repeated That's, any number of times. Those are Holman's papers? That is correct. Those are Ralph right. Holman's papers. Ralph, uh, for your listeners, uh, proposed the calling some fatty acids omega-6 and some omega-3 to distinguish the two families of fatty acids. That was Ralph's right. idea. Um, he, he left us in, I think, 2010 at the ripe old age of 93. Um, and um, anyway, our work in our laboratory for the last 20 years, we're not the only guys working on this, other people have over the years, but our work in our laboratory has identified, characterized the actual enzymes which uh, catalyze this process we have characterized exactly how they, these two fatty acids compete for uh, the, the conversion from the plant-based omega-3s to the EPA and DHA, the animal omega-3s, which are bioactive ones. So we know the genes, we know uh, the enzymes that are involved, 
we have insights into some of the genetics of how this works. We published a few years ago a paper showing that we can say something about uh, the levels of circulating uh, long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids based on just a measurement of uh, genetic polymorphisms. Right. And so we really understand this well. This is not some kind of a mystery that uh, is being proposed uh, in recent years. Uh, people have been studying it forever. It's one of the most reproducible phenomena I know of in biology. Right. So it's just the rapid decline in omega-3 is just a result of the ras rapid turnover of these phospholipids and not... It's, I've it's often a, wondered if there's a collateral damage element going on from it. That's part of it, but the... That's part of it, but the... the these two molecules are handled pretty much by the same enzymes all the way through the process. You eat omega-6, you eat omega-3, and, and, and when they get into the stomach, they're digested by the same enzymes. They get into the, the gut, they're uh, metabolized by the same enzymes. We talk about uh, them being activated into biochemical pathways. That's the way they, those same enzymes use them. There's some selectivity, but not a tremendous amount. Same for the conversion enzymes, almost certainly same for the uh, enzymes that actually take them out of the pathway and stick them into tissues. So there's this sort of so-called competition all the way through the process. And so you're right. swapping, you're swapping the omega-3s by a very high amount of omega-6. That's just the way it works. That this is, I don't think there's any controversy over whether it works this way. It, it just does. Right. Right, understood. Um, interesting, but I mean, you would think based on that, let's touch on your experience with the dietary guidelines a little bit. You would think that that would be reflected in some of the recommendations on how we eat. Well, you, you get into um, the much larger concept of, of how you develop guidelines. And I, I'll, let me say something positive. Certainly the food industry is not a bunch of evil guys who are just out to take everybody's money. I'm sure there's a few of those guys there, but I've known many of fine scientists that are, that are in right. food companies. So I'm not here to beat up food companies. That's important. However, if you look into the history of this sort of story, you see that since at least the 1870s, there's been a battle going on between the, uh, the dairy folks um, who create butter and the, uh, I like to say, amber waves of grain folks who create oils that can be made into something like uh, a, a butter-like spread. So there, these two gigantic entities. Butter alternatives. Are, yeah, they're they're battling over what we're going to spread on our bread in the morning. At least that was right. the, uh, and that's been going on forever since, uh, like I said, 1870. Since and before so, we knew what omega-6 was. Since that's oh, yes. long since before we knew what it was, yes. yes. Long before for, we knew what omega-6 yes. was. For, for, the, for those listening, you know the the what what we would consider a normal level of omega six has to be put into context. It's people eating vegetable oils and seed oils because of the <laughs> the predominance of it in our diet. And you would have to find a non you'd have to find a population that is not eating an industrial diet in order to find out what is a evolutionarily normal level in our bodies. Right. Yeah, that's quite right. Um, and pe people have looked at things like that. Um, one, but, but not to get you off your point there, you're, oh, you, sure. you were saying that this battle has been going on long before there are dietary guidelines, which came Actually, around in 1979, if I remember correctly, thereabouts. There is evidence that you know, there's something that came from, I was in the seventies, my recollection, it was close to that, that time. It was in the government report in, I think yep. it was 77. That's, that's right. 77 guidelines. And, um, uh, there, uh, see sort of bits and pieces of, uh, of, of this story. It, 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 there was a lot of talk and then I've uh, sadly been around since then and remember uh, what was going on uh, 
in the sort of polyunsaturated. I was a nutrition major in college in the 1970s. So I distinctly remember the oh, story. Yeah, of UFAs. that must have been a big deal. Yeah, it was a big deal. Um, and um, it, it filtered into classes, even though at the time I didn't know why. I'm just a little undergrad, right? Writing my notes out as fast as possible in a uh, big, with a big pen on a, on a piece of paper, and um, uh, it, it was the, it was in part um, a, a desire to sort of sort this out to um, decide between whether we would have vegetable oils in, in versus dairy now. One key point is that in the 20th century, up until the year 2000, roughly, we only had the oils that nature gave us. And so we had corn oil and soybean oil and sunflower oil and safflower oil. And I'll keep going down the list. And all the rest, yeah. Made, yeah, that could be made in vast quantities. Um, I, I know of only one place in the world that seed oils <laughs> Other than coconuts, another story. Coconuts a seed, but look, it's a weird seed. Um, I only know of one place in the world that seed oils were consumed prior to uh, the, the 20th century, and that's that's in northern China, where um, uh, the precursor to canola oil, rapeseed oil, um, was cultivated and pressed 500 years ago. There's there's a and tradition there. India's got an even older history with sesame seeds, and I understood rapeseed going back almost yeah, 2,000 they, they, years. They may well, yeah, rape, rapeseed. Yeah. And, and, and so, yeah, I mean, they, they may well, but I mean, it's, it's hundreds of years ago, and it may well be. The other question also is, is um, how widely available were those oils, right? I mean, was it just the kings and queens who were consuming that stuff, or um, what was it available to, to the common people who uh, were probably... I would say, particularly in India, relying on uh, animal fats um, for for their uh, for their oil needs. Yeah, this so, is a little uh, this is this is a little off topic, but when we get done with this, I'll send you a copy of a book titled "Vegetable Oil Consumption in Ptolemaic Egypt." Oh yeah, fascinating. Uh, good. I'll, I'll be delighted to see that. I, I I love reading that stuff. Yeah, it's quite quite interesting. But yeah, there's tiny little snippets in the uh, historical. Uh, record about these things, obviously, because folks like us didn't exist back then. <laughs> well, that's right. Um, prior, prior to, much prior to, let's pick a number, 200 years ago. Some people would say it's less than that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But prior to 200 years ago, linoleic acid was certainly much lower than it, than it has been since uh, the rise in the 20th century. And right. I don't, think it's, I don't think one can really ar argue that there were rich sources of linoleic acid, not like they uh, were developed right. in around the 1950s, at least. And um, <clears throat> I mean, the earliest one is probably, uh, probably cottonseed oil, actually. Um, now, uh, uh, the oils that were available were fruit oils, fruit oils, olive oil, palm oil. And when I say palm, I'm talking about um, very red palm oil, not the stuff which is, has the color taken out and all that. Kind of stuff. Um, if you if you look right. at primates in the wild, they climb the trees and they eat the palms. They eat the palm fruit, um, so they're quite quite happy. So so what? And there, there's a few other examples, but seed oils were very low, and they were really not consumed all that much as an oil outside the context of the seeds. A, apart from what we've just been mentioning, that there were places where there was some of that, but relatively relatively little. You've got the whole seed you got the whole nut you didn't have these huge levels you have sort of smaller levels where you get for instance the whole corn kernel or corn oil and so forth right <clears throat> and the cultivation of seed oils hey you know let, let's all agree that it, it's a good thing to produce high quality tasty calories and protein um for the masses at low prices we're about to go into a period where i suspect from the events in Europe recently, um, we're going to learn that in a big way. So it is. Yeah, well, yeah, the, Ukra the Ukraine is, I think, if not number one, one of the top two or three sunflower producers in the world. Uh, that's almost was certainly. last year. Yeah, that's almost certainly true. Yeah, that's right. 
Um, and for the, for the for those listening, you all know what the flag looks like right now. It's yellow sunflower fields and the blue sky above it. So that's a flag of the Ukraine. National. Yes, the flag of Ukraine, and that's how you remember whether it's yellow on the bottom and blue on the top, or vice versa. <laughs> Yeah, right. it's, a, it's a big deal. Sunflowers mm -hmm. on the bottom, blue sky on the top. That's exactly right. And well, so, what, what you were what you were describing in terms of you know it being a, a relatively good thing, right? We we go from the problems of starvation to the problems of obesity. It's the story of industrialization. It's the so, it's the story of of um uh the you know the modern era of of mass production of things. Absolutely. Well, you're sort of jumping, jumping to the punchline there, Brian. Let's. Uh... Well, yeah, you know, and so, so in the late 19, 19, in the last part of the last millennium, so when we, in the run up to 2000, we learned how to teach plants how to make different kinds of oils and rather than right. the ones that they were born with, sunflower, safflower, peanut, et cetera. And so the way we did that was uh, basically by modifying some of their genetics. So and I, I like to say that we, we taught sunflower how to make olive oil. So we, we, we modified the composition, we call it high oleic sunflower oil, but that has got the composition that's very similar to olive oil. Um, same I've, with soy, same with safflower, same with peanuts, you can go down the list. Not I've, heard, I've heard you say that whenever you hear high oleic, you should translate it to low linoleic. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. Almost every case, almost every case. The only um, exception that I carry around in my head is high oleic uh, canola, which- Where they're lowering uh, omega-3 as well. Yeah, they were- the rancidity problems. Another thing, and, and again, I defend the food industry, at least to some degree here, which is that um, uh, omega-3s are the thing that first makes oils and foods go rancid. So you're talking about shelf life issues here. Shelf right. life is kind of a direct connection to uh, price. If something right. lasts a long time and is fresh for a long time, then its price will be low. So again, that's a good thing, not a bad thing, okay? But if every company does the same thing, if everybody says, well, I'm gonna make my product have the best shelf life, so I'm gonna reduce this to omega-3, and so people get their omega-3 somewhere else or I don't even think about it, and everybody does that, you now have high omega-6, low omega-3, the whole diet is like that, and that's kind of the way we close the last millennium. Which is a fine example of how, you know, a little bit of a good thing. I mean, economics can drive you to perverse situations. Um, you know, it's it's cheaper. I mean, that's people often ask me, why did we start consuming these things? And it was entirely because it was cheaper and easier to produce than butter, which is what, and lard, which is what everybody wanted originally. Yeah, so, it's, so and which, right, which lard used to be the stuff you get out of after you slaughter the pig or whatever it is, although that's another story too about industrial, industrial, uh, industrialized production. Feeding practices, and yeah. And all that kind of stuff. Um, so once we learned how to make these high oleic oils, which really have a composition that pretty much looks like olive oil, now, now, the, now the discussion changes a bit. And then now you're talking about a fatty acid profile that looks like olive oil. Now it doesn't have all the same phytochemicals and the olive oil guys are very quick to say, ah, right, that stuff isn't olive oil, it's something else because it doesn't have our profile of uh, the phytonutrients and those are particularly beneficial. Okay, well, fair enough. Which is to get into a whole nother debate. Indeed, we'll, we'll, we'll <laughs> save that for- we'll save Right, that for another, another episode. That's right. Um, but at least from the fatty acid point of view, um, this is this is quite accurate. So um, right, and and we mentioned so dietary now, guidelines. Sorry, go ahead. So yeah, just one little point to close this out. I heard recently that um, apparently back in 2017, the Mars company committed to using high oleic peanuts for their peanut M and M's, one of my favorite candies, and. They weren't doing it for health reasons. They were uh, doing it because it increased the shelf life by tenfold over the high linoleic acid normal peanuts. Interestingly enough, apparently these high oleic peanuts also have 10 times the yield, which is pretty much an, pretty much an amazing feat of science. 
And I actually, I don't think these are GMO peanuts. I think they were a natural variety that was found in Africa. But, um, you know, so these, these alterations can have huge impacts on the food supply. So, so the, uh, I've been showing a slide since 2017 from a trade magazine, the title of which is all M&Ms, all peanut M&Ms will be high oleic. So that's, that's accurate. Right. Um, where the, I believe it is accurate that they are not GMOs, that they are made by traditional breeding. You can do traditional breeding a lot faster uh, if you know where the genes are, as opposed to um, not knowing- Just lucking out, are. yeah. Or right. And um, I have picked up that um, much of that early work was done um, by uh, crop scientists, plant breeders. Um, the University of Florida comes to mind. I didn't know any of the guys down there, but I've read about it. They may well have found something from Africa that, uh, that applies. Um, the, the way plants work is that they will be hyaluronic when they're grown in a hot climate. They will shift to more linoleic when they're in cooler climates. The right. concept has always been thought of as membrane fluidity. I think that is an accurate characterization in plants and in um, some animals for these kinds of fatty acids. But at any rate, that's the way it works. And so the yields are higher in arid, uh, hot, arid places. Uh, I don't think the yields are higher everywhere, however. And that's been some of the resistance against transitioning to these, uh, these peanuts. It's uh, the natural resistance of every producer to say, we're not changing anything. It's going to cost us a lot of money to change something. So you got to tell us right. why we really have to do it. Or you got to regulate it out of existence. Um, so uh, right. one, one would like not to have to do it by regulation. If you could possibly or the third alternative, what we're trying to do here is educate people so that they will start pushing the producers to change. That, that's exactly the uh, that's exactly the corollary to not regulating it, but 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 educating people to create demand and to say, yeah, let's let's use this um, a much more stable oil. Um, and so and so think of this, guys. So here's some real news you can use. So you go to that. Uh, we have in our building a, a vending machine, um, and it, it with snacks in it, and it's just a horror show of this kind of crap that you can that, that uh, junk food. And, and, yeah, exactly. And then I zero in on my uh, M M&M, M and M's with peanuts. And so, what do you have? Well, you have uh, peanuts or legumes. So you've got legumes. You got high oleic. So, uh, so that's a, that's good. And then you got chocolate. And chocolate is a similar kind of a thing with some with even some good chocolate stuff in it. Okay, there's a little bit of sugar to keep it to keep it all together. But this is almost right. health food. Yeah. It's, it is health food compared to everything else in that machine. You, you just have to that's pay the exact, that's that's exactly back. right. <laughs> yeah. exactly. Just don't eat too many of them. Don't get them yeah. like the, the only size that they that they sell in airports. <laughs> so what would your um, so the the audience has has learned you know how you know you're a researcher in polyunsaturated fat um, you know that you've you've been able to produce evidence of how important it is in in brain development in children, which is excellent. Um, and um, I'm sure there's a lot of you know. Uh, you you could take that and extrapolate to other ages as well, I'm sure, and 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 for brain health. But what would you? What's it? What are plausible dream studies that you would like to be able to? Implausible, right? You know, you don't have a trillion dollars. <laughs> what's what's something you would? What's a profile? You know, what would what would you love to be able to explore and 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 take from here? And by the way, Tom, I asked Amir Taha the same question, and his answer was showing that linoleic acid causes um, Alzheimer's disease if he had a billion dollars, which I can't give him because I don't have a billion dollars, but you are at the Dell Medical School. So there are guys walking around down there who do have a billion dollars. Yeah, I haven't found one that I can grab my ankles and turn over and shake yet, but uh, <laughs> I'll work on it. <laughs> you, you know, um, I uh, Amir has a uh, uh, and, and an interesting idea there, and he's got some really beautiful data um, in his models that indicate that there's uh, something going on there. So, so th that's a good one. I think we should put on a huge push towards brain health, 
Um, and that I, I like to say, if you take the set of all scientific questions, that sounds like something a mathematician might talk about. So what's the set of all, the set of all sets, right? Right. So Tucker, at least Tucker and maybe Brian will be familiar with that kind of a question of mathematician. So I had an old friend who was into number theory. So I think like that. What's a set of all scientific questions? And so is it how to, here's a scientific question that's on people's minds. Is it solving climate change? Um, if a meteor was headed to the earth to blow up the earth, would it, uh, would we, should we have a way of diverting the meteor and not all dying? Um, uh, think of anything else. Well, what about optimizing nutrition for building and maintaining the best brains? What about that one? Well, my entry is that one. And the reason is because the identification of questions and the identification of their solutions depends on our quality of our, sol of our solution to that building brain problem. We right. need high-end brains and we need lots of well-functioning brains in order to solve every problem. So that is, in a sense, a meta problem that sits on top of all the other problems. Does anyone think they have too many IQ points? Does anyone think that their mood is too good all the time to be able to use those IQ points? No. And we're not talking about drugs here. That's another story. Um, and But in, in terms of building the most and best brains, that's the core issue uh, that I think we should be investigating. I'll say well, something else, which is... Yeah, sorry, go ahead. I'll say something else, which is, which is, I think, I hope could be some, could be a bit compelling. The debate in the United States, uh, one of the debates in the last couple of years in the United States uses a couple of words. One is equity and the other is the older word of equality. And they have meaning in each one of them. This is social, these are social words. Well, it seems to me that feeding mothers and babies well is where equity and equality come together. There, right. there is no equality if every kid doesn't have the nutrients they need to grow their brain in utero and after birth. You can't talk about equality of anything if you don't feed mothers and babies well. So I think that's something maybe maybe we can all agree on that we should feed mothers and babies well. It's brilliant. Uh, yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. Well, but this this I mean we've gone a long on a long fascinating tangent here from the question of why isn't this currently what the dietary guidelines are recommending? Yeah, you did ask me that, and I never answered you. All right. So what do you? How do we get? I mean, I completely agree with what you just said it's pretty clear that stupid people don't solve problems very well. And if we're making ourselves, you know, there's a lot of fussing in the market and in the quote unquote health community about what they call nootropics, right? Things that make you think better. Well, this seems, you know, I'll tell you my personal experience with this. When I decided kind of on a lark one day to cut my intake of omega-6 fats, my neurological functioning improved immediately, enough so so that folks I'd been working with for years started to comment on it, how much better why my mood was, my temper was, my reaction times increased, my you know acute mental acuity increased. I mean, it was frankly embarrassing to be working in a high functioning environment and have your behavior change so radically in such a short period of time. Right, I can't think of a better nootropic than this approach for the average person who's listen, looking to improve their mental functioning. One of the guys who'd worked for me for years, he said, you know, and I've said this before, he said, Tuck, before you fixed your diet, you're a bit of an asshole. You're a much nicer person now, and it's much easier to work with you. Well, it was uh, embarrassing. Since we're doing, <laughs> since we're doing anecdotes, um, I, I now have... Uh... I'm up to four grandkids, and um, right. the two of them uh, scarf down salmon um, like you wouldn't believe. They just stuff it into their mouths, 
And it's very difficult not to observe that they're one and two years old. Well, the older one will be three soon. Um, and it's very difficult not to observe that um, at um, their little preschools that uh, the, uh, uh, the the folks that work there that watch kids almost fight over uh, having them in their class because they're uh, so well behaved. Not pushovers now, right. but they 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 um, they and they have very different personalities. One's outgoing. One's still too little to be outgoing. But at any rate. Um, they just seem to be really very balanced in their uh, in their moods, and uh, and the older one seems to be incredibly smart. But I wouldn't be distinguishing myself from any grandfather if uh, by making that statement. Of course, you you without a doubt you have the two brightest grandchildren on the planet, <laughs> or the four, I guess you four. said right, right. <laughs> um, so back to our back to the question that you didn't answer <coughs> twice. Yep. How do we get this so, into practice? So, um, my my sense uh, we're going to have to do another like two hours on this, but the 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 dietary guidelines folks um, who I believe are very well intentioned, certainly the staff at, at USDA and the staff at uh, FDA that I've uh, been involved with are, are well intentioned. They're trying to do the right thing, but there are lots of technical barriers to what can be done and some of them are, are intentional some of them are not intentional from the perspective of political barriers and so there's only so right. much time to, to, to discuss various things various concepts for one thing um we are fixated now on um only human studies and uh, we we say right so it's only it's only randomized trials it's the evidence-based nutrition evidence-based medicine kind of model where you you want these randomized controlled trials or maybe prospective uh, cohort studies that is that is measuring everybody's, for instance, omega-3 level and then seeing, watching for five or 10 years to see who develops heart disease or some other thing. And yet, um, and yet Ron Krauss, who's a very distinguished cardiovascular disease researcher, says he can't get funding from them for diet research. He has to go to the dairy industry. Who, who, who I have um, I have published with uh, Ron in um, some with some uh, c clear statements about that kind of stuff and getting uh, money out of the NIH to do some of these kinds of things. I mean, they, the NIH doesn't really follow the recommendations for research that the dietary guidelines has puts out there. So between 2010, 2015, I, I haven't looked much at the 2020, the most recent one, just because I'm tired of looking at things that are not going to change. But right. the recommendations for research, when we looked at it in 2015, when I was on the committee, virtually nothing from 2010 had been followed. I don't think much of anything came out from 2015 either. The NIH is, is moving a little bit in that direction. There are signs, but I, I, I don't really see it. So Ron's, I'm, I'm on on course with Ron about So there's a, there's a big disconnect then between the dietary guidelines and what's pursued and, and in the research community. And the thing is hugely the thing is hugely political because you got giant companies and I work for a giant company so I understand the motivations and I understand that um, uh, th that uh, you, you have a huge investment in in, in creating a product um, you can't just on a lark change uh, and say ah well that product's no good now. Um, and and right. so there are those kinds of issues, and I would never, um, I, I guess I've said it several times, but still you have people advocating for their, for their products, and, um, and, and so you have a, a, a lot of politics in there. We, we, they don't consider any uh, of the preclinical stuff. They don't consider animal studies. You know, animal studies is where we know almost everything about nutrition. I, I, in my right. first day at Dietary Guidelines, uh, it was probably 2013, we met. I said 95% of what we know about nutrition comes from animal studies. So we're only going to consider human studies. And the answer was, yep, that's it. So, and that, I mean, all, you know, to toxicology is for fairly obvious reasons done almost entirely in animals because you can't say, gee, we think cyanide may be bad for people. Let's give it to people. Well, that's a point. I well mean, that's taken, an extreme yes. example, but. No, it's not an extreme example. I disagree. It's an example I use too. I say, look, what about okay. tox? What about, in other words, I mean, do we have any any meta-analyses of randomized trials that shows that um, 
that uh, arsenic is a bad thing to eat in your food. We don't have right. any of that yet. Here we are having conversations about lowering arsenic levels in rice. Okay. And but, in drinking water, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and anywhere, right, exactly. But the point is we're having, we, we, we toxicology. So these are actually FDA rules, right? So one end of FDA says you do it this way. Another end of FDA says, no, we're going to dis disregard any of that stuff. We're going to do it in a different way. And is it, so... It, is it fair to say, um, I'm sorry, if you, were you finishing your thought? I apologize if I was cutting you off. No, sorry, all these years of being a professor, I just keep lecturing. So please. <laughs> Maybe that's where my instinct comes in. I see you're on a, you're on a tear and I'm like, oh, let me just, let me just interrupt you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> is it fair to say that evidence-based medicine, like you described with human beings, is biased towards pharmaceuticals? In terms of the environment and getting things done and and being able to produce results and univariate analysis and things like that? Um, I think that it was developed for pharmaceuticals and for the priorities of pharmaceuticals and that mapping that onto nutrition and using it in a, let's say, slavish way exactly to apply to, to nutrition, particularly to macronutrients, that doesn't work. Um, and the reason that it doesn't work, at least in the strong form, is to say that, that the pharmaceutical model and the toxicological model is that you have some kind of a background, both genetics and diet, so an environment, so all these things together. And then you add this thing on top, it could be a toxin, could be a drug. In medicine, it could be a procedure, it could be this kind of a stent or that kind of a stent. And then you say, are things better or worse than the way we were doing it? And if they are not better, or that things better are the same, let's say it that way. And if they're not better, you discard that thing. But we had a mindset where even 10 years ago, you, you put DHA on top of a, a diet and you say, well, are things better or the same and you come out with the same and if the if the then if you go you say well obviously we don't need dha anymore well no it doesn't work that way right because right i think rams DHA. i think the only one who's actually tried doing the intervention that you would approve of is christopher ramston and his migraine studies where he's lowering you know lowering linoleic acid in the hopes of improving dha function Right, I can't think of another anybody else who's ever tried that approach. Chris has certainly brought it to a high art, yeah. and has demonstrated uh, very clearly that um, you get results when you do that. Yeah, He's I guess I guess when I I, sh I should say him and you have both used that approach. I, being unfair there, my apologies. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. We we um we uh, uh are friends. And uh, we seem to be influenced by sort of the same kind of basic science. And we, uh, uh, at least when he was doing those studies, um, uh, we're interacting a lot. So I, um, I, I just, I think his stuff is great. Um, but, you know, this all being said, uh, that, that stuff kind of comes and goes. He publishes a paper, but it doesn't seem to really stick. And, and it would be, Getting the word out right. that and creating that demand, as we were saying earlier, that if you lower linoleate and then raise another healthy oil, you can substitute it with a lousy oil, and then maybe that would be bad too. Maybe an oxidized oil or some kind of junky thing. But if you if you substitute it with a um, a healthy oil, you're going to get results. And um, furthermore, right, but... the amount of DHA that you would make you know, long chain omega-3 that would come in to the diet would be that much more effective. Right, uh, right. Against the background and, of a low... And the, the fish oil supplementation studies, a lot of them are just missing that whole interaction. Yeah, they are. And many of those fish oil studies don't even me measure the, uh, the omega-3 status. They don't even measure it. They just say, here's a pill. The biomarkers. Okay. Here's a placebo who, who uh, does better. And they're not even right. measuring it measuring what they're doing so you don't even know if there's compliance i mean another another little story and this is there's subtle reasons for this 
you, it, you're, you're listening, this is tech, this is really inside baseball, but there's something called intent to treat. Mm -hmm. And in, in the way, when you analyze a study using the so-called intent to treat principle, which is required, by the way, by essentially every medical journal, you assign a person to treatment and, uh, and whether they take the drug or not, you count that in the treatment. So if I assign someone to fish oil and they don't take the pill, I still say that the people assigned to fish oil didn't get better or didn't have improved function. That's what intent to treat means. Right. And it doesn't show you the actual mechanism of the no, effect of the That's called drug protocol. or the food. What's missing is compliance. Right. What's missing is right. compliance. And so the reason that you do that is because there's some treatments, pharmaceuticals again, that are so miserable that people will not comply. So what right. a physician wants to know is, if I write a script and hand that to my patient, will they get better? And that's what an intent to treat tells you. Right. But if, you, but if you're going to look at mechanism and you can just say, well, as far as I'm concerned, you get an effect when you change DHA status, then you have to measure whether you change DHA status. And you also have to measure whether some of the placebo people who know what study they're in didn't start taking omega-3s while they're in, in your study, even though they said they wouldn't, because that happens too. And then you get right. overlapping groups and there goes your, there goes your study. So that's right. why using studies where you control all of the input into the mouth, I know exactly what I fed those kids in Malawi um, is a huge advantage because I can do intent to treat and it's exactly the same as compliance. Either the kids got better or they didn't. If they didn't get better, I don't put them in the analysis because that tells me they didn't comply. That's part of the rules. Otherwise, right. it's, 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 uh, so this is, this again is something that really ought to be uh, thought through a little bit more carefully. We typically don't look at these kinds of things when we do compilations of studies, meta-analyses, systematic reviews. We generally don't take a look at those details. Right. Just to shift gears here a little bit, you wrote an interesting paper looking at fatty acid status and COVID. Um, I wrote a long exploratory blog post a couple of years, kind of going through the same thing, which ultimately led me to interviewing Bruce Hammock, um, whose work I'm sure you're familiar with if you don't actually know him. Um, talk to us a little bit about the results of that study, because that's obviously very topical. Um, COVID outcomes vary a lot by obvious factors that one could say are related to diet, you know, obesity and type two diabetes. What, what conclusions did you come to there? So um, taking us back to COVID, the COVID era, we were all locked in our places and maybe had a screen in front of us. And we said, what can I do about this? And we were working on that review um, when COVID hit and uh, I thought, well, let's, let's sort of start, everybody was, re every biomedical scientist was uh, reading about COVID, trying to understand what, what it was all about. There was no real, there was no such thing as an expert because it, it, we were all starting from well, just right. the identification of a new virus. And um, we started talking about cytokine storms. Um, that was a, sort of a remarkable thing that made it, that broke through into the popular press. And the, the root of the, of the cytokine storms is in the lipid mediators that are uh, come from the polyunsaturated fatty acids. And so there is a connection directly right there and then. Right. And it should be noted, of course, that cytokine storms are not unique to COVID. They're, That's correct. We find them in lots of other infectious diseases and other situations. That's right. The, the other thing that, that uh, was, uh, was really hitting... The, uh, the papers at the time that we were drafting that was what appeared to be a, what I'm calling a thrombotic storm. That is to say that uh, blood clots were being detected by pathologists uh, in the brain, for instance, and in, in lung and in, in, in other places. And um, there, was a, there was kind of a mystery uh, as to why it was that um, the uh, so-called oxygenation level, that is the, uh, the, the amount of oxygen that was in the blood that is related to lung function, could actually be very low 
Uh, whereas people are sitting up talking to you and under normal circumstances when it's that low, they're unconscious and uh, near death. And, I've seen uh, it. So I was in the room. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's when you were doing the yeah. pulse ox, we, did you have a device on the finger? No, I'm just saying it's fascinating. Yeah, we would. Yeah, you'd have that. Oh, yeah. Just that, that okay. was standard, but it was it was fascinating to be able to see. You know the, you know, like like you said, having conversations with people at a at a lower level. You know, it's horrible and no, when patients no are distress. You know, and then and you and then you do it. You do a blood gas. You know, do you do arterial blood glass in order to confirm too and. Um, but no, it just, for those listening, yeah, it's, 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 it was pretty fascinating to, to witness. It's, it's terrible when medic, when patients ignore the medical textbooks on what they're supposed yeah, to be right. doing, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, so anyway, you were, you're making a point. I don't know this has ever really been explained, um, but, but one of, at least one hypothesis was that you get local thrombosis. That is, you know, if you're measuring, if you're measuring um, oxygenation by putting a, putting a sensor on the finger, and you're getting very low levels. Well, maybe you have very low levels in the periphery, but they're not low levels in the brain. That right. may well be the case. And so that was at least one thought that that potentially you had differential thrombotic uh, effects in, in various places. And so what are lipid mediators also involved in? Well, they're involved in clotting, very clearly involved in clotting. In fact, the early data on why by uh, the inhabitants of Northern uh, Canada, the Eskimos, uh, and called that in the original papers in the 70s, had very low rates of cardiovascular disease was because they had very long bleeding times. And why did they have very long bleeding times? Because of all the omega-3 they ate. So right. uh, that connection has been around since, uh, well, since I was uh, uh, in my academic gestation, let's say. So, um, uh, so, so we, we uh, said, look, you know, if, if this high omega-6 is related to both clotting and to uh, uh, inflammation, then perhaps this is a contributory factor to this condition and that uh, um, we were all, not all, but many of us were really set to be triggered by this virus, at least, but that's speculation. Everyone should understand that uh, it's speculation, but speculation grounded in a fair amount of uh, good data. Bruce Hammock's work um, has uh, been really uh, fantastic. He's a great scientist and um, uh, we've interacted on numerous occasions. Um, his work is a little bit on, not a little bit, he's, he's really championed the, um, the uh, let's call it anti-pain uh, properties of uh, omega-3 fatty acids and, and a whole bunch of other things along those lines. I, 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 think of that anti-pain story, what's called anti septic that's a technical word, but anti-pain, and uh, that if you uh, have a high omega-6, low omega-3, you're actually more susceptible to pain. And uh, Chris Ramston's uh, data appears to bear that out as part of the, I mean, Chris's other ideas as well um, about right. what the mechanism might be, but that's um, uh, that's part of it. Uh, Bruce also has some, some really good ideas about uh, about how those very same lipid mediators that, that mostly he's studying, other people are too now, but led by, by Bruce, um, may actually be particularly positive um, for the effects that we see in COVID. Um, and, and so this all could be in part an omega-3 thing as well. Right, right. Yeah, I talked to him at length uh, about leukotoxin which I can't remember the chemical name of it, but that is, he did a paper, I think after yours, where he looked at leukotoxin levels in COVID patients and leukotoxin induces ARDS. And he found that as one would expect, leukotoxin levels were sky high in people who were suffering from severe COVID disease, which suggests that this uh, omega-6 to bad outcome makes pretty good case that it's operant in real humans in, you know, the ICU. Uh, some fascinating work. Right. Um, so just how on, how on earth did you get interested in this whole polyunsaturated fatty acid topic? I was uh, 18 years old and I uh, got some financial aid 
at my undergraduate university, uh, UConn, University of Connecticut. Oh, no and kidding. Okay. I'd taken a year of um, elementary nutrition and other prerequisites, and I walked into a lipids lab um, and uh, was looking for a job, and they hired me. And so, <laughs> so I entirely serendipity. <laughs> Well, what else is the, how else do we end up in things, right? Um, yeah. And, um, the, uh, the guy I worked for, Bob Jensen, was a distinguished uh, lipid scientist. He was a dairy scientist, particularly dairy scientist, and had done much of the work in characterizing the lipids of dairy milk, and then was transitioning in the late 70s, early 80s, into characterizing the lipids of human milk. And um, he had his own, we had our own uh, laboratory hanging off the back of the, uh, the nutrition building, the Jones building at UConn. And uh, it was all his, or I should say all ours. And I have never had a better parking space on a university campus than I, when I was driving a rusty old uh, Ford Maverick uh, as an undergraduate, but parking right next to the laboratory. And um, that lab, um, was very much a chemical laboratory. And what I uh, learned, at least by some sort of osmosis, was that um, a huge amount of nutrition is, in fact, chemistry. And uh, so I ended up, I ended up uh, taking lots of chemistry classes, made my way to Cornell, uh, and then from there made my way into the chemistry department, where I ended up becoming an analytical chemist, uh, working with some some of the best people in the world at the time. Um, and um, that's how I ended up at IBM because I was doing things that IBM cared about. And then uh, more serendipity ended up in the nutrition department at Cornell. So that's the, that's the uh, short story of how I kind of went from here to there to somewhere else and uh, got to where I am now. When I got here also, well, I'll throw this one in there too. Um, two years after, um, after a, uh, uh, joining the Cornell faculty, uh, my wife had um, premature twins. Uh, uh, Daniel was uh, 1,120 grams, that's two pounds, seven ounces at birth. And uh, Maggie was 545, that's one pound, six ounces. And that was wow. uh, 31 years ago, which uh, was pretty early days for uh, weights like that. Um, they're both great. Dan's a chemical engineer. And uh, Maggie uh, had uh, two of those little grandkids of mine and we were getting stuffed full of salmon. And, um, but uh, when I did what anyone would have done, what either one of you would have done, and, and uh, even Brian before he was a, 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 a medically qualified, uh, you start digging through the literature and reading and reading and reading. And what I realized right. is that this omega-3 story was just beginning there were uh, folks like Susan Carlson and Ricardo Wowie and Bert Koletsko and a handful of others who in the late 80s were beginning to realize that premature infants that were surviving at much higher rates um, may well have a huge issue with the DHA in their brains. And uh, so we got involved quite early in this whole story. And uh, uh, oh, and I, I, I put um, more anecdotes. Uh, I, I, uh, I said, here, here's fish oil uh, to my wife who was uh, nursing them or expressing milk and then it was fed to these little preemies. I put her on a gram a day of fish oil back uh, 31 years ago. Interesting. And, uh, so that, I have N equals two on this one. So um, it's, um, so that's worked out, worked out pretty well. At that time, we didn't even know if the VHA got into the breast milk. We know that it goes roaring into breast milk. Now, yes. Yeah, that reminds me of a quote I found uh, a few years ago, writing one of my blog posts, quote, in the rat, some protection of the brain against diets containing little fat or with high dietary ratios of omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acids is afforded by the poor breeding performance of rats maintained on these diets. That's from a paper published in 1975. Boy, if only we paid more attention to the animal models. Well, there is that, yeah. Um, th that, there, there, <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, as, as you know, I've um, reviewed that literature on nauseam. And so, uh, boy, yeah. I could go on and on and on about that. But um, 
that I, I'll get an, I'll give you another one, which is comes from a 1990 paper from Ralph Holman, one of the last papers he ever published, um, which was on omega threes in pregnancy. And uh, basically, he said in the discussion, uh, and who reads discussions? Most people don't. But in his discussion, he says, you know, we're taking all the omega threes out of out of our food supply and leaving with very high omega sixes. And uh, there's a vulnerable period in the early in the early part of life. Uh, where omega threes are required and metabolically, and uh, there may be no time later to uh, fully restore um, what's needed in those early days. Um, right. And so um, that was a really uh, filtered uh, paraphrase, but the sentiment is right. And uh, so um, anyway, I, I I like that one too. That's great. Tell us a little bit about your. Uh the uh, Seafood Nutrition Partnership. Right, oh, I'm glad you asked about that. So the Seafood Nutrition Partnership is a roughly seven or eight year old uh, nonprofit, uh, which was uh, founded by a handful of uh, executives and former executives in uh, the seafood industry. Uh, and its mission is to educate the public on the benefits of eating seafood. Uh, and, and really we stick to government's kind of uh, recommendations. So for instance, the, the dietary guidelines for Americans is, is, is pretty pro uh, seafood. This last one, the, at least the mm -hmm. advisory committee report was very pro seafood um, and it's increasingly uh, pro seafood. So we can then point to that and say, look folks, we, uh, we, we should be eating more seafood. We have other sort of um, functions of, of uh, helping people to understand how to, to buy it, how to prepare it. And it doesn't have to be $40 a pound, although that stuff is pretty delicious. But, uh, but there, right. there, there are outside uh, a lot of people's abilities to. Uh, there's there's entry level seafood. So you don't have to, yeah. go, to, uh, to go to that, uh, that extent. Um, and um, we're, we're uh, moving towards uh, pulling together the seafood industry, um, which has never been much together. The, uh, all the other commodities, uh, let's say beef and pork and chicken and, and uh, the avocado people, the walnut people, the hot dog people, all have sort of uh, uh, groups. Trade groups. That, that, yeah, yeah they're, they're trade groups, they're marketing groups in a way. Seafood has never had that. And... Um, we're, we're, we're trying to pull together these groups and uh, to, uh, because if, if everyone's got one except you, then you're going to get the short end of the stick. And, and so, right, yeah. exactly. And so um, uh, we, we are also, uh, we engage very uh, commonly, very often with uh, producers and with the environmental guys. So we have a symposium every year that's in September, you can get online, it's free. If, uh, if there's room, it can be registered uh, in, uh, it's in DC in uh, roughly September 21st or 22nd, something like that. And, um, uh, and we often will have uh, uh, speakers from the Environmental Defense Fund or Conservation of Nature Conservancy or, these, and, or, or NOAA. National uh, Oceanographic and uh, Atmospheric Administration, so the fisheries people, who will tell us about this question of uh, are we emptying the oceans, or how do we do sustainability, or how do we do uh, right. fish farming, and, and so we're not talking about simply emptying the oceans. We are we bring those folks in and we have them explain to us technically how it ought to be done. Um, and, uh, and we, we also have done some, uh, some work on um, uh, the, the big, the elephant in the room, which is the mercury story, uh, and uh, uh, have shown in a review that we published a couple of years ago that uh, the amount of mercury in seafood is so low as to be uh, not the dominant thing, that the nutrients of seafood are important. It's right. the absence of seafood in the diets of pregnant women that's dangerous. Yeah, I to to your point before, um, when my older daughter was uh, 
when my ex-wife was pregnant with my older daughter and she was craving sushi and her doctor had told her not to eat sushi, I did a deep dive into mercury and the stories, I think the Mauritius study found that six times the level of mercury from fish than what Americans get has no negative effects. And they said exactly, I mean, you know, 20 odd years ago, what you just said, that the nutritional benefits outweigh a small mercury exposure that has no detectable effect on humans. Now, you can eat fish caught outside a mercury plant that's leaking mercury into the ocean, and that you want to avoid. But other than that, it doesn't seem to be very material. You're, 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 you, you got that right. Uh, the, the, there's mercury, mercury poisoning events. We recognize those. Certainly those are issues, and that's right. No one's talking about that. Or if they are, I would be strongly opposed to them. Right. Um, well, <laughs> um, we we uh, looked at the data. There's a Mauritius study. There's um, the, the, the Seychelles study, which is Seychelles are an island group uh, in, in the uh, Indian Ocean, that, and they eat 10 right. times the seafood as the average American. Uh, and, that may uh, be the one I'm thinking of, yes. What, uh, maybe, but there's another one. There's, there's, there's a couple studies. The Seychelles... The Seychelles study was started, I think, in the 1980s by uh, folks I know, and they are toxicologists who started that. And the reason they went there is because they figured they'd find very high mercury levels um, in uh, the moms there and thought they would see um, uh, problems in the kids' uh, cognition. And uh, when they got there um, and, and measured hair mercury and looked at what they ate, they found this business of having 10 times the seafood much higher mercury levels, and they found, well, uh, the way one of them tells the story uh, in public, um, he says, well, we found, um, we found two uh, relationships, we found, we found three relationships that were significant. One was slightly negative between mom's hair mercury level and the kid's performance in school, and two were positive, so net positive with mercury. Right. I smiled when he said he was going to look at mercury because I figured it was just going to be what we call in science a proxy for fish consumption. It would just follow fish consumption. The more seafood from the ocean, the more the, the higher the mercury, but within this very narrow range, which is much below where you expect um, toxic effects. And that's exactly what they found, and that's exactly what they reported, and that's exactly what they'll tell you if you call them up and say, okay. is there a problem here? And no, there isn't a problem. So talk to, just, talk to us a little bit about. Uh, farmed fish versus wild caught fish. That's a big thing in the ancestral health community. And yes, that's right. One last sentence on the on the mercury story. Sorry. The FDA 20 something years ago became interested in, in mercury out of abundance of caution and a, and a small number of studies that they said you should maybe be careful about this. But now we have a huge number of studies that all point in the same direction. So now the advice should be shifting. Now you just asked me about farmed fish versus versus marine fish. Yeah, wild caught. Um, wild caught. That's right. Wild caught fish. Um, so uh, the amount of wild caught fish uh, in the world and in properly managed fisheries, which would essentially be all of the ones in the Western Hemisphere um, and many of the ones in the rest of the world, and they're not all. They're not all. Uh, Properly managed, but but um, the 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 amount of fish is not going to increase. It hasn't increased. The harvest has not increased. I think since 1990 or so. So right. the only way to expand the supply of fish is through good fish farming practices. In some species, the some species will eat grain, and if they eat grain then their fatty acid profile will look like the grain you feed them. Right. And so like, examples of that- Like any other animal. Then, yes, that's right. Like, like almost any other animal. It's not true in ruminants. Yeah, um, ruminant. Right, 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 right. So um, uh, so it, but like any non-ruminant, chicken, pork, turkey. Right. Anyway, um, People. and in, in, um, in some, of those, some of those species, catfish, crawfish, tilapia, they'll eat anything. Other fish- like uh, salmon, um, I like to say they have the good sense to die if you don't feed them DHA. So um, <laughs> you, 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 they, they kind of are obligate carnivores in part because they, they, they need 
um, right. DHA to live. And so, um, and so in studies that were published uh, in, um, well, they were present in 2015 because I presented it at Dietary Guidelines and people were shocked to see that farm fish actually had a higher absolute amount than, of DHA than uh, the wild caught. Those are in those, are in those restricted species, uh, salmon, trout, and those are ones that, that they are specifically fed DHA in part to keep the DHA levels higher. They also have higher total fat because they just like domesticated animals, they just sit there and they float and yeah. they don't even have to stand up. So they're very efficient in terms of feed conversion ratios. They're, 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 fish farms are pretty green, um, but they also get fat. Right. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I ordered a salmon once at a restaurant that was so fatty, I had to send it back. It was disgusting. They, they, and, yeah, they, they've been quoted as, I've, I've heard one, one uh, person refer to them as floating hogs. But at any rate, um, so uh, we can, though, do, uh, do this well, and we should insist that it continue to be done well. And again, this is educating the consumer. And this is saying that we have to keep track of these levels so that um, so that the nutrient profile matches that of the wild. Now we're, we're not right. there, but I, I like to call this the industrial food principle that when we produce animal foods, their nutrient profile should match that of the wild caught. So is a chicken a chicken? If it's got a whole different nutrient profile as every other chicken, I don't think it is. I don't think we should call it a chicken. We call it something but, else. So it sounds like though that you're you know, for instance, better off eating farm-raised salmon than you are an industrial, an industrially raised chicken, which is yeah, I'm going to get barely food that, by my I, definition. I think, I think that's probably right. Um, and uh, not everybody is going to be able to do that. We don't have enough salmon to do that. Right. Um, but um, we right. do have ways of improving the omega-3s in chicken. We have ways of improving the nutrient profile in chicken. We have ways of doing that. And um, again, the chicken producers are trying to produce the cheapest stuff they can possibly produce, and that's not a bad thing. However, can we do that and maintain nutrient profiles? That's where we ought to have some kind of floor. Uh, right. That uh, because otherwise, you've got the cheapest food in the world and the most expensive medicine in the world, right? And family physicians don't like stuff like that pediatricians don't like stuff like that right we want to actually feed people well and and worry about medicine in well-fed people rather than having the correct nutrient deficiencies giving them drugs yep well that i think is to be mindful of your time an excellent place to wind this up because i don't think there's a better statement one could make about how nutrition should fit into medicine um Tom, thank you. This has been very enlightening and informative. Um, you're as quotable as ever. So I appreciate that. Um, Brian, any any wrap up question you'd like to ask? Uh, Honestly, I'm Brian? having so much fun with this. I wish this I wish this was unrecorded with beers and we were all in person <laughs> for 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 a few hours. You know that'd be great. Okay, rain check. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, sometime. So you're in Austin. I'm in Austin. Uh, and, That's a great place uh, yeah, to meet. Yeah. So come on down to Austin. Um, uh, I won't say when it is in 100 degrees because I don't know when that's going to be. Yeah. Um, but uh, but there'll be there, uh, we have margaritas here. Oh, I love it. Okay, perfect. But yeah, that'd be great. I want. I'm. I, I love it. Yeah. Don't we? We won't waste it on the beer. We'll have margarita. that will be awesome. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm more of a margarita guy. Yeah, for sure. Margarita and ceviche. Yeah, it's yep. sold, sold, by, totally by sold. Five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> um, well, well, it's a real pleasure speaking to you guys, um, and uh, best of luck with uh, with the series. Yep, Thank so great. Thank you so much. This, um, yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Okay. I'll, um, yes, I would love to talk to him at some point. I've read, I've read a lot of their literature, but I haven't ever talked to anybody in that group. But what? What happened in so, Generation so Mark, Six? Mark went to Mark went to uh, back to Harvard, and he, um, he he instructed that diets be made up with oils that had only DHA and arachidonic acid, and, and that they should be fed to mice through ten generations. And 
Uh, now, he'll tell the story, but my recollection of it was that uh, they were at a science scientific group meeting and um, a, um, a, a person working in the animal facility says, uh, hey, so the number of litters come from this particular few mice is, is X. And uh, someone else said, no, it could, couldn't be. Those are old mice. And they said, no, no, that's, that's the right number. Those are the same mice. Um, and so the way Mark tells the story, or did tell the story, is that um, it, it, that those diets uh, prevented muscle pause. That is uh, to say, that wow. is to say, those mice never became infertile late in life, or maybe did much later. Um, and um, they published the paper in a way with a title and an abstract, which is usually the only thing you see on PubMed unless you dig it out. Um, but they basically said omega-3 fatty acids to maintain fertility or something along those lines. The emphasis, in, in my opinion, should have been low linoleic acid. Of course. Mortality and then maintains of fertility. And then um, uh, uh, on top of that, the mere fact that they had survived and thrived and done wonderfully over uh, six generations kind of tells you what to be, you need to know. Um, right. Later on, the later study that they, that they did, I was a little ambiguous on what diets they used. And so I'm not sure that they were, that they were completely scrubbed of uh, linoleic acid and, uh, and, and alpha uh, and, 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 and the omega-3 uh, right. plant one alpha linoleic. So I'm not, I'm not sure, and I didn't analyze them. If I analyze them, we'd know. If I analyze the animals, we'd know. But I didn't, and I'm not sure they did. Yeah, so, their paper um, says it was only DHA and AA. Um, yeah, but the oils that they used, I think, are, I, I may, may or may not, uh, that may or may not be correct about those papers. That was certainly the intention. And right. I cited it, but when I did a deeper dive on it, I, I'm a little bit ambiguous on that. So we may have to, it, it's a normal scientific question i mean you read a paper right. and you're right because sure even it. fish oil can have i think omega vin has like a half a percent of linoleic acid fish oil, fish oil has there's no such thing as a fish oil that doesn't have linoleic acid linoleic right. acid right. is around it just right. is and and it's actually at what we in our early in our conversation a moment ago we're saying well you know before seed oils it was this number okay well it is that number in fish oil so it's uh right it's low right. but it would prevent and and we also know from Kane's work that um if you put both uh, uh, both omega three and omega six linoleic alpha linoleic into um, a diet, they can compensate for each other a little bit, not a lot, but a right. little bit. So, right. if, if you say two percent is necessary for linoleic to prevent skin lesions, that's the classic symptom. But if you put two percent alpha linoleic, that number goes way down from two percent to one percent. I would need a whiteboard to show you all these numbers. Right. In my numbers, the point I'm making is there's plenty of stuff in there. In the early data from the 1950s, and I've reviewed this data, and I've written about it. It's in one of those uh, one of the papers you just cited. <clears throat> the early data showed that um, that arachidonic acid is more effective in, in reducing skin lesions than linoleic acids. So, if the question is what's the most effective essential fatty acid, the answer is arachidonic. It's not linoleic. Well, it gets it. And you'll all often read in the medical lit literature that a that LA and ALA are essential and DHA and arachidonic acid are conditionally essential. And it sounds like they got it backwards. They do. They do. It's a it's a it's 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 a meme that has never died from the 1950s. And I'm not making that up. Yep. And I've had I've had lots. It's of not the only one. A lot of people have looked at this. You really have to know. Uh, the original results and the details, and it's just this meme that won't die. It's also embedded in in, in federal law, um, dietary guidelines, and, and, and even baby formula. Baby formula yep. has a requirement. Last I looked, baby formula required linoleic acid, and there's no requirement for omega three. Yes, it. I I just looked at that in like probably the last six weeks, and it's still that. That's still the it's case. Still like it's crazy. They they need their heads examined. And, and it's just, you know, they, 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 they embed this stuff in law. They don't fix anything right. based on new knowledge, which is what dietary guidelines are supposed to do, by the way. That would be yeah. nice if B20, B24 dealt with all that stuff. But anyway. We'll see. It's time to, to we all right. <laughs> it's time well, to Well, 
yeah thanks again this was really okay. fascinating all right, Thank guys. I look forward to that uh, margarita or beer, or, or maybe at the maybe at the uh, what do you call it place? Bur bourbon Barrel. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm here. Oh, <laughs> sweet! I've heard of that place. You're Tucker, you're on. Where, where you're absolutely you on. Tucker, are you in Idaho? I'm in Boise, Idaho. Yes, I ah. lived most of my life in Connecticut and moved out here uh, a year and a half ago. Where Connecticut? Uh, Fairfield County. I grew up in the okay. town of Wilton. You were in stores when you were in school, I suppose. I was. I grew up in Naganek. Oh, okay. The other end of the state then for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, what's just, yeah, I mean, that we've, we've counties in New York, and I'm sure you have them in Idaho that are bigger than the state of Connecticut. So, uh, yeah, well, right, exactly. Connecticut's a postage stamp. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good talking to you guys. Thank you, you so much. Great. Thank day. you very much. Bye-bye. Like Thank you.